as you're sitting here with your eyes closed, there are many things you can be thinking about. You could be thinking about the breath. You could be thinking about events today, events tomorrow. You have lots of choices. There are lots of potentials here in the present moment. So trying to choose the best potential and stick with it. Like getting the mind to settle down with the breath. Explore the way the breathing feels in the body. And take an interest in this energy flow that keeps you alive. That allows you to be aware of the body, allows you to move the body. Try to make it a good place to stay. You have that choice. Now you have to work at your skills to do this. The issue of free will in Buddhism is never an absolute free will. The more skills you have, the more freedom you have. So we're working on developing the skills that we can bring to the present moment. This is an essential part of the teaching. The Buddha wasn't the sort of person to go out and pick fights with other people get into arguments, unless other people brought arguments to him. But there was one issue that he would always take exception to, and that was that we don't have any power in the present moment. There are people who taught that everything you experience right now is a result of some past action, or the result of a will of a Creator God, or it's totally random, that you aren't responsible for your present experience right now. The Buddha would actually go out and seek those people out and argue with them. He took the issue that seriously. He said, if you believe that, then there's no path to practice. People kill, steal, have illicit sex, lie, because of things that are totally beyond their control. And that, he said, makes the path impossible, if you believe that. And if you teach that, you're leaving people bewildered because they have urges coming up in the mind. And they have no basis for even believing that they can choose which train of thought to follow, which ideas to follow, which ones to say yes to, which ones to say no to. And when you have no basis for making those kinds of decisions, you're left defenseless, you're left suffering. It's because of this that I'm always amazed at people who say the Buddha doesn't teach free will, that he teaches that everything is determined, because he was so opposed to that view. The other thing that I find amazing are the people who say it's such great news to know that they have no free will. You wonder what kind of mind would think that, a mind that doesn't want to be responsible. But it's a very depressive thought. You sense a lack of agency, a lack of being able to decide what to do and actually carry through with it and have an impact on your surroundings. You're pretty miserable. It's one of the definitions of depression. There's a famous case in American history, William James, an American philosopher. When he was young, he wanted to be an artist, and his father put every obstacle in his way. And he finally gave up. And as he gave up, he started thinking about the issue, well, does anybody have any free will? He went into severe depression. The only thing that got him out was reading a book by a French philosopher whose name I can't remember, a follower of Kant. He said the fact that we can choose our thoughts is a sign that we do have free will. So James decided his first act of free will would be to believe in free will. And eventually he was able to get, based on that, he was able to get himself out of that depression. Because as the Buddha points out, as the Buddha pointed out, our past actions do have an influence on what we're going to experience right now. Because they're not the whole story. 
And if you can bring certain skills to the present moment, you can take the results of past bad actions coming in from the past that are sprouting right now and learn how not to suffer from them. This is an important ability. This is why we're able to practice. And this is why we practice, so we can learn those skills. The more skills we have, the more freedom we have. He listed five altogether. One is to make the mind unlimited. By that he meant developing the attitudes of the Brahma Viharas. Limitless goodwill for all beings, limitless compassion for those who are suffering, and limitless empathetic joy for those who are happy, and limitless equanimity in cases where you can't make any difference. These attitudes enlarge the mind. You can train yourself in virtue, train yourself in discernment, your ability to see what's going on in the mind what choices you're making, which ones are skillful, which ones are not. The ability not to be overcome by pain or pleasure. This is one of the skills we learn as we practice concentration. When you sit down, one of the issues that immediately comes up is the fact there's a pain in your knee, a pain in your back, pain in your hip. You need the skills not to be overcome by those pains in order to get the mind to settle down. First order of business is to find a part of the body that you can make comfortable by the way you breathe. And learn how to maximize that comfort. If this pain is going to have your hip, let it have your hip. You've got other parts of the body that you can focus on. It's like that old book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, where the instructor recommended that it's, when you're drawing a face, don't draw eyes or noses or mouths. Draw the spaces between the eyes and the nose, between the nose and the mouth, between the mouth and the lower part of the chin. In other words, look at the areas you don't ordinarily look at. See them afresh. And you find you can draw a much more realistic looking face. So here you're focusing on parts of the body that are not immediately calling for your attention, but you can make them comfortable. And then you can think of that sense of comfort spreading through the area that has pain. Say there's a pain in your knee, you let it go down the leg, through the knee, down to the ankle, out to the toes, out into the air. In other words, don't let the flow of breath energy get blocked by the pain. There is that tendency that we sometimes breathe around our pains, and they constrict what we can do. Think of the breath penetrating them. Remind yourself the breath is energy. The energy can penetrate every atom there is. And then you can ask yourself about the perceptions you have around the pain. Focus on the actual sensation itself. And ask yourself, is it the same thing as the body part that it's in? Is it a solid block of pain? Or is it moments of pain? If you can see it as moments of pain, then you ask yourself, are those moments coming at you or are they going away? This is an exercise both in concentration and in discernment. And the fact that you're taking a more proactive approach to the pain means you're not running away from it, you're not being victimized by it, and it's going to hurt you less. And you're going to come to understand the relationship of the sensations of the body to the sensations of pain, and see that they really are separate. Sometimes this analysis will actually make the pain go away, other times it won't. But there's a sense that things are separate, so you don't have to be feeling oppressed by the pain. So this is one of the skills in which you can deal with the results of past bad actions and not feel overcome by them, because you're not overcome by pain. 
But it's also important that you learn how not to be overcome by pleasure. As you start wallowing in pleasure, you're opening yourself up to the pains that can come following on pleasure. Here too, concentration helps. You work with the breath, you make the breath comfortable, and you have to make sure that you don't get distracted by the comfort. The comfort is there, but you maintain your focus on the breath. Work with the breath energies throughout the body, trying to develop a full body awareness. From the top of the head down to the tips of the toes, the tips of the fingers, everything, all at once. And learn how to stay right there. Try to forget about the books you've read that say that you shouldn't get stuck on concentration or that concentration is a dead end. It's not a dead end, it's part of the path. And the ones that tell you, well, you have to move on fast to insight. The Buddha basically says, learn how to settle in. Be at home here. That probably calls us we are a Dhamma, a dwelling place for the mind. So you get a home, you don't just go into the house and then come out. You go into the house, you decorate it, you make it a home, and then you can stay there. And as you stay there, you start learning things about the mind that you didn't see before, which is why concentration is the basis for discernment. So hold on to the breath and allow the comfort to do its work in the body. And then it will grow more and more calm, more and more calm. And here you are, working on the skills that help to protect you from the results of past bad actions, so that they get minimized. There are also the skills that work to release you in totally in this whole mass of samsara, this whole mass of karma. After all, the Buddha said the path we're following is a path of actions that leads to the end of action, a path of karma that leads to the end of karma. So these skills we're developing here help us in a lot of ways. What they basically come down to is whatever your past, you can be here in the present moment and not suffer with whatever over whatever comes up. Thoughts that appear in the mind, pains that appear in the body, things that happen outside. You've got the skills. that allow you to be more and more free in the present moment. Think of the Buddha's teachings on dependent core rising. When he talks about the results of past actions that come at sensory contact, and so that's about halfway through the process of dependent core rising. The factors that come before, those are the ones we work on as we meditate. The perceptions the skills that allow us to be with pain but not suffer from the pain, be with pleasure and not be overwhelmed by the pleasure, perfect our virtue, perfect our discernment, develop expansive attitudes in the mind. These are the things we can bring to the present moment. These are the skills that we can carry with us. So don't be afraid of being attached to them. Is another problem of reading too much. We're afraid of being attached to concentration. But as John Fung said, if you're not crazy about your concentration, you're not going to get good at it. We're working on a skill, so you want to be really attached to mastering the skill. Attached properly in the sense that you take a mature attitude toward it. But don't be afraid of being attached. You can work on your attachment to concentration later, after you've used the concentration to pry away your attachments to other things. Think of a John Cha's example of the banana. Coming back from the market, carrying some bananas. Someone comes up and asks you, 
What are you going to do with the bananas? You say, I'm going to eat them. How about the peel? You going to eat that too? And then John Chai asks, with what are you going to answer them? And his answer is twofold. The first is he says, you answer them with desire. In other words, the discernment that allows you to come up with a good answer is based on desire. You want to give a good answer. And the answer, of course, is that the time hasn't come to throw the peels away. If you throw the peels away now, the banana turns into mush in your hands. You never get to eat it. So there's some things you have to hold on to. And when they've done their duty, then you can throw them away. So these skills that we're working on, the skills of the Brahma Viharas, virtue, discernment, mastering the arts of concentration so that pain doesn't overcome us and pleasure doesn't overcome us. Hold on to these skills. Work at them again and again and again. Learn how to master them. And this way you find that you're more and more free in the present moment to do what's skillful, to be a free agent, and to actually make a difference right here, right now.